answer here. In 1989, the Catholic convert, an American essayist, Walker Percy, came here to Notre Dame to receive the Laetare Medal at the commencement. And in that very short and marvelous address, he said that growing up in the South, and not as a Catholic, he was accustomed to the names of universities. Alabama, Georgia, Ole Miss, and Tennessee, he said. But Notre Dame struck him since his childhood as different. And on that commencement day, Percy said, I found it extremely touching that a university, a community of scholars, a great football team, should call itself quite simply by the two lovely words, Our Lady. I still find it so, and he said it is one of the many reasons I am so pleased to be here today. This Saturday's With the Saints is about those two words, Our Lady, and how they form the heart of what it means to be a university and to gather on a Saturday morning such as this. And to this end, this talk is a pilgrimage. We are going to explore this one lady by stopping in some of the most important places where she teaches and guides and holds together what it means to be on this campus. And for those who are just arriving, there are a few empty seats kind of scattered throughout. You're welcome to take one of them. Don't hesitate to sort of squeeze on through. But we have to begin our time this morning, not here on campus, but in France at Notre Dame de Paris. It's a familiar sight to all of us, Notre Dame Cathedral, which has stood since the Middle Ages as a veritable epicenter of the faith in France. And when Father Moreau invited Edward Soren to join him as one of the very first priests in Holy Cross in 1837, both of them not only loved Our Lady, but knew that devotion to her was not to be taken for granted in their tenuous times. For just before their ministry, Notre Dame Cathedral suffered something more devastating than the fire of a few years ago. It was a major desecration. The French Revolution affected all parts of their society, and at certain times the mob got carried away with itself. The Virgin Mary was taken down from Notre Dame Cathedral, and in her place was put up a new goddess of reason, and she was paraded through the nave of the church and through the streets of Paris. The white mantle and the blue sash of Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, had been supplanted by the white-dressed, blue-mantled, and red-capped Goddess of Reason. You can see her on that bottom right picture being carried around on a platform by other fellow Parisians in kind of a subversive Marian procession. Yes, in some ways that's worse than a major fire. And it's into that context a time when Mary, friends, was over, that Holy Cross was born, and Father Soren and six Holy Cross brothers came here to northwestern Indiana at the invitation of the bishop to start a school, a university, at the earliest possible moment. This arrival is important not only because it stands in response to the overturning of Our Lady in France, but because Mary becomes a new means to draw life and light out of the most humble circumstances here. It's our important context for getting why, what we mean by Our Lady of Notre Dame. When Father Soren and the brothers arrived, all that was here was this log cabin chapel. Many of you know it. The original one burned down, but in 1905, this reconstruction itself was made by a freed slave from Kentucky. They came in the dead of winter, November, and had not much on their journey. At one point, those first missionary priests and brothers ran so low on supplies that they had to choose and decide together whether they were going to buy oil for their tabernacle lamp next to the Blessed Sacrament or oil to cook with. It was one or the other. Thankfully, they chose the lamp because the light burning next to the Blessed Sacrament, they said, reminded them that they were in the presence of God and they were here to do God's work. And within the first three weeks of being here, Father Soren wrote the famous letter back to France, to Father Moreau, about Notre Dame becoming one of the most powerful means for good in the country. It's cited a lot. And it's captured also on that plaque over by the log chapel. 
But folks miss, by cutting to that famous line, become a great means for good, how it was that Mary also provides the first image set for Father Soren and those brothers' imagination. So on December 5th, 1842, Father Soren writes the following. This attractive spot has taken from the lake which surrounds it the beautiful name of Notre Dame du Lac. It's from here that I write to you now. Everything is frozen over. Yet it all seemed so beautiful. The lake, especially with its broad carpet of white, dazzling snow, quite naturally reminded us of the spotless purity of our august lady, whose name it bears, and also of the purity of soul that should mark the new inhabitants of this chosen place. We were in a hurry to enjoy all the scenery along the lakeshore of which we had heard so much. Though it was quite cold, we went to the end of the lake and like children, came back fascinated with the marvelous beauties of our new home. Once more, we felt like Providence had been good to us, and we blessed God from the depths of our soul. There's more going on here than a commentary, perhaps the first one in Holy Cross, that South Bend is a tough place to spend a winter. The snow on the lake reminded them of Mary, of her purity, purity of soul. And that's a comment about the people who should be produced by such a place as they were starting. In Father Moreau's language for Holy Cross, this is about educating citizens for heaven just as much as training them for earthly society. And this produces in Father Soren and the brothers who go to the end of that frozen lake a sense of wonder. They take up the postures of children, of openness, of astonishment, and marvel at that which is around them. In other words, in that moment, Mary does two things. She inspires them once again by a higher calling, a purity of spirit, and then also makes them students, learners, fascinated with the world immediately around them and their experience of it. Father Soren's devotion to the Blessed Mother never waned during his life. He would place letters on a Marian altar and leave them there overnight to pray with them before he sent them. And it was his devotion to Mary that prompted that a big statue be placed of her atop the dome. That statue is in imitation of a very famous one in Rome of the Immaculate Conception. There's a picture on the left of Pope Francis. He goes there every year praying at the statue on the Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. But that doctrine in our church was produced in, uh, pronounced, excuse me, infallibly by Pope Pius IX during Father Moreau and Father Soren's lifetimes. And this column in Rome has four prophetic figures who point to Mary in the Old Testament at the bottom. David, Isaiah, and if you went around the other side, Ezekiel and Moses. And atop the column is that which you see on the right, the bronze statue of the Blessed Virgin in the Immaculate Conception by the Italian sculptor Giuseppe Obisi. This doctrine is one of the great examples of how the church considers the positive faith. We're not coming up with new things. Rather, we're deeply considering that which in Christ and in the Old Testament we have been given. And since at least the fourth century, people had been arguing that there had to have been some special preparation of Mary by God's grace to receive and give flesh to Christ the Savior. That doctrine became known as what we would call the Immaculate Conception. And in terms of the statue itself, I want you to notice two things. First, Mary is standing on top of both the world and the moon and standing on top of a snake. If you remember from the book of Genesis, the serpent, or the tempter, is the one who says to Adam and Eve that if they eat of the fruit, they will be like unto God. That's right. Though Adam and Eve had everything in the garden, everything they could ever ask for, the one thing that they did was to deny their creatureliness that they had been created, and to try to be gods themselves. It was the one thing they thought they lacked, and we humans have a great propensity for this, for it has been the difficulty of us trying to be the gods of our own lives and our predicaments ever since. And since Mary is portrayed as stepping on that snake, she is stepping on the doubt planted in the seed of human freedom that eventually led to our downfall. 
that snake, Genesis says, would otherwise bite at the heel of Eve, that primordial woman. And so Mary is doing Eve's route and Adam's route in reverse. Whereas those two reached beyond their own creatureliness to try to be gods themselves, Mary's humble. She's entirely open to God's grace, and therein called blessed by all generations. As one with 12 stars atop her head, she is both the hope of all 12 tribes of Israel and the first among the 12 apostles. Of all the Marys that Father Soren might have chosen, he picked this statue by Giuseppe Ovisi. The first statue of Mary on the main building, it's actually the second main building, was made of metal. And sadly, that main building burned down in April of 1879. It completely destroyed the building and, sad, and sadly the whole educational apostolate because the main building at that time had the library, the dining hall, the student residences, and the classrooms. You can see it there on that postcard from the archives on the right. Father Soren returned from a trip he had been taking and met with the community and gathered in Sacred Heart Church, which was still standing. And out of that time of prayer came his claim that it was clearly a sign from Our Lady that it hadn't been built big enough. <laughs> I wish we all had the courage to treat dark days like that. But however Father Soren delivered that line, and I do wish I could have been there, the most remarkable part is not the way he said it, but what happened next. The Holy Cross community and the locals from South Bend gathered in order to rebuild. The fire was in April, and from the ground up, 3.5 million bricks later, they had the building minus the dome open for school in the fall. Yes, that's five months. The dorm next to me that's going up on Notre Dame's campus will take two years. <laughs> but this gets us then to one of the key points of controversy in this story about Our Lady of Notre Dame. Father Soren wished to build the dome larger and to cover it in golden leaf in honor of Our Lady. The Finance Committee of the Holy Cross Order said not only no, but no way. <laughs> it would jeopardize the finances of the entire global order. Father Soren, in the way that made him a marvelous leader, but probably not a saint, bided his time and waited until he could become the chairman of the finance committee. <laughs> then they did it. <laughs> Mary, a replica of the Giuseppe Obisi statue created by a sculptor from Chicago, was not only placed atop a larger dome, she was gilded in a way that was to reflect the very light of the sun and the moon. Now, for any who worry that Catholics worship Mary, which we do not, just let me claim that as a member of the theology department, putting a gilded statue of the Immaculate Conception atop of a dome also covered in gold looks a lot like she has become the highest spiritual priority around. But this is not the case, for Mary's prominence atop the dome is actually the central idea of what it means to be a university. And now is when we need to do a little bit of scriptural theology in order to understand why. I need you to think about and imagine as we look at Mary in a couple of these scriptural lines, Mary as a student, or even in our contemporary words, as a researcher. We receive the most detailed accounts of Mary from the Gospel of Luke. And in the first instance that we're really introduced to Mary, she's greeted by Gabriel, the angel of God, who says, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with thee. Mary's response is not that of immediate understanding, but rather a bit of confusion. Luke puts it, she was greatly troubled at what was said. That's reasonable enough. If any of you between now and game time were to be visited by the angel Gabriel on this campus, I suspect we would respond in the same way. But what Mary does next is she sets up the whole way in which she models for you and me what it is to learn. Luke says she pondered what sort of greeting this might be. And that's right, from this instance onward, Mary becomes the one who thinks deeply, who ponders, that which she doesn't on first glance understand. 
And this isn't the only time we hear this sort of language in the scriptures. When the shepherds came to the infant in the manger and spoke about hearing the angel chorus, Mary, Luke recounts, kept all of these things, reflecting on them in her heart. Yet again, when the prophet Simeon says to Mary that Jesus will be a sign to be contradicted, he says that a sword of sorrow will pierce your heart. You start to get the picture. Luke's gospel forefronts all these images of Mary, the mother of God, who is a ponderer. She's a thinker, maybe even the best one. And we can think about this in terms of education in the following way. The subject of Mary's learning, her field of study, her major, was the most important one, and the data set was comprised entirely of her son. And in many ways, he was a hard son to understand probably much more so even than calculus. Even during the earliest parts of Jesus' life, he must have been something of a mystery. Her pregnancy came with the overshadowing of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' birth came with visits from shepherds, magi, angels, and a star. And when they couldn't find him on the journey home, after being in the temple, they found him teaching there from a young age and referring to his father's house in a way that indicated not Joseph, but God his father. Mary embodies for us what it means to have faith that still needs to seek understanding. And for that most difficult subject, her son, she continues to ponder, to think deeply about the mysteries that have been given to her. This is the hope for any of our students and our researchers here at this place. First, that in any of our disciplines, we might take up the disposition of Mary in the search for truth. In any field of research, like her, we might study truths however they disclose themselves to us, whether in the laboratory or the library. And like Mary, we might ponder them deeply in order that in due course, we might actually come to understand. In that way, she is the special patroness of all who struggle to grapple with the truth. But she also lifts our vision to consider that highest of truths, God become human, that of Jesus Christ. And her abiding on the dome is not only to inspire those who study, but to remind, that those, to remind those of us who study that we look at temporal truths only in order to habituate ourselves to contemplating eternal life. For the truths we produce every day at this place, in our research and in our laboratories, are not meaningful, she reminds us, unless they make us true in the process. It should make sense that Mary is atop the Golden Dome, for she, the greatest example of a ponderer, has something to teach all of us who are students and faculty and friends. But she is not at the heart of campus. Her son is. And it's important to notice how that statue of Mary on the dome is facing a heart-shaped section of campus, which for all time we mistakenly call a quad. <laughs> of Jesus at the pinnacle of that heart. For the mystery that Mary pondered, that of her son, is one that confronts people here on their own level. The sacred heart of Jesus is the center of campus where the words venite ad me omnes in Latin, or come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you will find rest for yourselves, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. The true learner who follows Mary's example ends up right in the heart of her son. And if that is what she is able to manage in her witness, if she can teach us how to approach Christ the truth, then she is worth every bit of thinly hammered gold leaf we can offer. For we do not worship her. We are guided by her. As you can see, we've come a long way, though, from Mary being dethroned at Notre Dame de Paris in France. Here she's set on high as a model of excellence, that she might define the whole enterprise of what it means to be a university. And it means that the rest of the Marys on this campus each have some vantage or lens 
for what it means to study, to learn, and especially to do those things and grow in understanding of the mystery of our salvation. There's no way we can even visit a fraction of them, but I am going to offer five of what I perceive to be the most important. And so our first stop is the exterior of Corby Hall. Corby Hall, the home of the Holy Cross community, was rebuilt just four years ago. The original Mary statue, Queen of Heaven, was refinished and placed in the same niche it was in the old Cor Corby Hall. But a new piece was added to the back, facing the grotto. If you walk around behind Corby Hall after visiting the grotto, you can see it this afternoon or evening. And it's a depiction of the flight into Egypt. When Herod was looking for the newborn child in order to kill him, Joseph received word from the angel that he should take Mary and the child and flee to Egypt to leave their own home and family behind in order to go a land not their own where they didn't even speak their language. To do this, they clearly had to put the Christ child first in their lives. And you can see in this relief, Mary with the child Jesus in her arms, riding on a donkey with Joseph walking alongside. It gives us true important truths concerning learning about Jesus Christ. First, divine revelation, the advent of Jesus, didn't happen in a palace or a public square or, to be honest, even a laboratory or a library. It happened first in a family. And though unconventional, that family of Mary, Jesus, and Joseph provides a specific lens of relationship to Christ in order to come to understand him. Second, that family journeyed together even when they were in lands not their own. And if you were from Nazareth, in Egypt of all places, it's pretty rough. The life of Holy Cross and the life of this university is structured around this principle. We, the priests, brothers, and sisters of Holy Cross, try to relate to each other in such a way that we model our lives on the Holy Family. For this reason, the brother's patron in Holy Cross is St. Joseph. The sisters is Our Lady and the priest is Jesus the Savior. In short, if we're going to dedicate our lives to learning about Jesus, we'll only be able to do it if we ourselves are in a family. And further, that family with Christ in its heart will inevitably call us to places we've never dreamed of going. Egypt, for instance. But don't forget, friends, that for people from Le Mans, France, Notre Dame, Indiana, has that sort of end of the world feel. <laughs> or perhaps, for many of the Irish immigrants who fled the famine in the 1840s and 50s in Ireland, it felt the same coming here, abandoning their green hills as well. Even now, students come here a long way from every corner of the world. People often speak, and especially on football weekends, about the Notre Dame family. And what they say about it is true. The connections of grace that happen here have fed the starving, rebuilt broken parts of the world, and connected people of goodwill in friendships that have lasted lifetimes and more. But we, what can often appear on glossy brochures has a humble theological root, traced all the way back to Mary. For her yes meant that our Lord might become incarnate in a family, as the first place of learning the ways of grace. And though our students and our alumni come from every corner of the world and are sent out to others, the challenge of the flight of Egypt is a testimony not simply to the power of family that animates everything from our dorms to our alumni associations, but it's out of necessity. If we're to learn the mystery of Christ, we will never do it alone, but only alongside our brothers and sisters. Any of us who have a family, and certainly those in Holy Cross, know that for all of the difficulties of family, like the flight into Egypt or the arrival in South Bend, it is also a school for joy. And here I point you to the moment that the late Father Tony Lau, CSC, caught this exchange beautifully between Mary and her cousin Elizabeth. This is just outside the bookstore by the Eck Welcome Center. This encounter is still focused on Christ, though he's not visible. But it gets at the heart of how it is that Mary, as the mother of a university, can also be a teacher of what it means to be overcome with joy. If you remember this encounter, Mary goes to the hill country of Judah during her pregnancy to stay with her cousin Elizabeth. 
much is theologically rich in that bit of scripture. Because in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant had dwelt in the same hill country centuries before for the Hebrew people. So Mary is already bearing the mystery of the New Covenant within her own self. She becomes, in one way, the Ark of the New Covenant. But what Luke records of that time that Mary spent with her cousin Elizabeth is not what she did for those months of her pregnancy, or even how Jesus grew within her. Rather, we get a simple interaction, and the second half of the words from the Hail Mary, and a disposition for how it is that we might receive the truth that we learn. When Mary greets Elizabeth, Elizabeth responds in two ways. First, her own child, John the Baptist, leaps in her womb at the arrival of Mary. And Elizabeth explains, exclaims, most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now, at the most basic level, I think we could probably all agree that there's something in all of us that rejoices at new life. A few years ago, here in South Bend, as a new priest, I was the chaplain to a young mom's group, completely out of my depth. Right? <laughs> I learned a lot every time I went there. They also had great snacks. <laughs> but we talked about this passage at one point, and the conversation turned to what it was like to be pregnant in public. And I don't know if this has ever been the experience of the moms here in this auditorium, but these new moms said that other people couldn't get enough of them. They would come up in the grocery store, complete strangers, and ask questions that we would never ask to strangers. <laughs> How far along you are, and why if you know what it's going to be, etc., etc. And young people, especially young children, without even knowing them, would come up and place their hands on their pregnant stomachs. I can't even imagine how awkward this would be. <laughs> but apparently it happens all of the time. There's something deep in us that's willing to recognize life. But Elizabeth takes this human disposition to recognize life and ratchets it up one step further. For the prophet, her son, leaps in her womb. Her very being rejoices, and she speaks with the grace of the Holy Spirit. In short, the disposition of one who contemplates the infant Lord might require that we ourselves become open to feeling joy, newness, life, and hope. It's striking that this exchange greets all of the visitors of campus when they arrive at our welcome center. The physical pilgrimage onto this campus might be one in which the most joyful part of us begins to leap at the possibility of encounter with Christ the truth. And I should just add on this the feast of St. John Paul II. This is how he defines the university, as those who know what it is like to experience the joy in searching for the truth for its own sake. But in addition to the truth, it is also the work of a university to grapple with the most broken aspects of our world, some of which are beyond our power to fix. And for one of the most important images of Mary, we go around St. Joseph's Lake to the cross in the woods. It's the final station of the cross around St. Joseph's Lake. And there, Mary models for us perhaps the hardest of all things we have to study in life what it means to have hope in the midst of sorrow. And as our constitutions in Holy Cross so eloquently put it in two lines, there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother Mary, who knew grief and was a lady of sorrows. She is our special patroness, a woman who bore much she could not understand and who stood fast. To her many sons and daughters whose devotions ought to bring them daily to her side, she tells us much of this daily cross and its daily hope. This is the extent to which Mary, the student, the learner, is willing to experience and contemplate the mysteries of her son. She's willing to abide with him, to stand with him, even at the cross as he suffered and breathed his last. She was unwilling 
to give up her engagement with Christ even when it became tough, when all seemed lost, when her family and her vocation seemed to have been humiliated, and even as his own friends and disciples abandoned him. She stood there, and she stood fast. And as we ourselves learn and teach at this place, Mary helps us to understand suffering in our world and in Christ's body with a whole new sense of purpose. The going gets tough here and in our world from time to time. We abide here on campus with students through tragedies, through changes in career paths, through pains of building good faith in a world where often mistrust and brokenness seem to have the upper hand. And it's Mary who stands as our courageous witness and inspiration for what she do, what we do, because she stood next to the cross of Jesus, her son, when she knew she couldn't fix it herself. She was faithful. And even though we stand on this side of the resurrection looking back, she was willing to be what we call yuxta cruce, or next to the cross of Christ her son. And in our mission as Holy Cross, this is how we understand ourselves and our work as an order that runs universities. We too are going to have to go and stand next to Mary at the foot of the cross of the suffering Christ in order not only to appreciate the resurrection to come, but to be able to move with courage and integrity anywhere the body of Christ suffers in our time. Our fourth and fifth images for where Mary helps us to think about the work of this place are also at the core of campus. The first is the Basilica of the Sacred Heart, for it's here that Our Lady helps us to realize that our contemplation of Christ after his ascension takes place in the context of the church. And though the Basilica is named for the Sacred Heart of Jesus, I wish to point out to you precisely what many people miss, which is how that mystery is pointed to in the architecture all the way along by Mary. At the middle, in the top, use my laser here, here, and here. At the middle there, in the, at the top of the transept, Mary is being crowned Queen of Heaven in that final archway before the tabernacle, or near the tabernacle. And on either side of the transept are two massive Marian windows, the biggest ones in the church. And the one on the right is closest to the Golden Dome, and it's the Pentecost window. Mary, after all, had been open to receiving the Holy Spirit from the very beginning of her pregnancy, when she said yes to bearing the child Jesus in her womb. And here she stands at the very middle of Pentecost. You can see her there in the center of it in blue. She's more prominent than all of the apostles. She is the one who, receiving the Holy Spirit, helps to form the church to be the very members of the body of Christ the head who's gone before into heaven. And the left-hand large window is the end of Mary's life at the time of her assumption. That's right. The natural light from both the east and the west, the largest windows in the place that cast light onto the altar for mass, are places where the light is colored by Mary's role in our church. And the great constitution on the church from Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, describes this phenomenon as follows. She is the mother of the church since she brought forth Christ. And the church's work of sanctification and healing keeps its integrity Inasmuch as through the church, at Mary's example, Christ, and this is an amazing phrase, may be born and may increase in the hearts of the faithful. And so Mary connects the work of learning about Christ to the ongoing missionary work of the Catholic Church done in communion. It's through this work that we do the global work of witnessing the healing and hope that Christ might be born and increase in our hearts. And that brings me to the final of the five major stops. You knew it was coming. <laughs> it's the grotto, inhabited by our students, day and night, and with a picture that gets uh, almost 180 degrees of it. It's here that Mary teaches us to pray, and there prayers are offered by those who are both the most seasoned and those who simply know that they need help and do not know where else to turn. But the grotto is special in terms of Mary for another reason. And it's, the con it's that the contemplation of Christ her son is not the exclusive learning of an intellectual elite, but radically open to all, and especially 
the poor. For in Lord's France, a young and poor girl, now Saint Bernadette, began to receive apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the edge of a stone grotto where livestock were tended. And it's so, what, as is so sadly the case in matters of faith, those who were authorities in her family and the church didn't believe her. And so the lady who continued to appear gave her a name to say to the authorities, I am, the lady said, the Immaculate Conception. Yes, now, friends, our story comes full circle. For the Immaculate Conception is the same title for Mary that is on top of the Golden Dome that Pius IX declared in 1854 and claimed aloud what the Church had long believed about Mary's special preparation by God's grace to give flesh to the God of the universe. That truth arrived at after centuries of study. Pius IX's discourse with all of the world's bishops and then the infallible declaration by the Pope himself, that same truth was simply given as a present to a young and poor girl of faith. Lord's is a vision of the world done anew. And since that moment, Lord's France has been a place where all of those who suffer some form of poverty, who are ill, sick, are most, or most in need, are celebrated bathed in the waters of a spring from the location where the lady appeared. And if you're to visit the grotto on this campus at any time of the day or night, you'll find there people who do not have the answers, but who seek them. And it's from the poverty of not knowing, of needing direction, of seeking intercession, and of needing healing, that we, like St. Bernadette, prepare our hearts to receive truth that might come first from God, that Mary might help one such as her receive it, gives us all the hope that we, in our poverty, might too discover the riches of Christ herself. Where does that leave us, friends? Mary's not only an ideal patroness of a university, she provides us a veritable course in all of the ways that you and I might learn and grow. We've seen how Mary inspires the greatest contemplation of the truth. She does so as one who ponders deeply that which she does not understand. She leads people to the open arms of her son. She images the family into which the Savior was born and can be known. She causes those who greet him to jump with joy at the mystery she is so open to. And she gives us strength to stand at the cross of suffering, joins us in the communion of the church, and is an ongoing witness in her own life and that of St. Bernadette. The greatest mysteries of the faith are available to the most humble and but I wish to tie this pilgrimage together with two final points that have to do with what Mary means now for us and especially for our students. One is a picture of an off-the-record place, and the second is a prayer. First, I live alongside 221 young men in Dunn Hall, about 70 yards that way on this campus. Immediately outside of my room is a small space and I took the opportunity a few years ago to try, to try to make this Marian idea of a university come alive for my neighbors. You can see here four of my neighbors, conventional Dunn Sentinels, honorable men, of course. <laughs> they were helping test where these two images might go. But there are two pictures. And the first is the cover of Time magazine from 1962. There was Father Hesper, whose devotion to Mary was sincere and deep trying to explain to a world who thought that a Catholic university was a contradiction in terms what Notre Dame was about. And he took the angle in that piece that the Catholic university was open to all truths, including the truths about divine revelation or those of our faith. And since secular places were not open to those truths, it would be, he thought in this article, the Catholic university that would become the location of the greatest discoveries of our time. It would be the place of, and this is the important line, a new renaissance for humanity. And wonderfully, in the book which Father Hesburgh is holding open on that magazine cover, you can see there are three pages. Clearly one has mathematical things on it, and another has chemistry. 
And those truths of mathematics and science are certainly at play in this image. But the front page on that book is a painting of the Madonna and Child by Giotto, located now in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Italy. And this painting is most frequently considered the very first painting of the Renaissance. It is Our Lady who might inspire the mission of a Catholic university in the modern world. It might be, because of her, the site of the new Renaissance. And these characters on my floor have taken to calling those two chairs underneath the images of Our Lady the Renaissance Lounge. <laughs> and much happens in those seats. Phone calls home, late night paper writing, a lot of procrastinating, conversations that sometimes signal the beginning or the end of a relationship of love. But it is here that the hope that Our Lady might animate the purpose of human formation is exhibited for them and for me daily because of those pictures on the wall. And the final piece I have for you is a prayer. I end every class that I teach at this university with the same prayer from freshmen through PhD students. And for my freshman students, those of you who are here know it, you've already learned it, I require them to memorize it. <laughs> for it brings together precisely what it means to be a university called by the two words, Our Lady. And for as I explain to them, every student who graduates this university will receive a diploma marked by Mary, not just in the fact of being called Notre Dame, but by the three word, words that on their diplomas are sealed in gold on the document. And you see them right at the heart of, on the pages of that book. And they're the three words that authorize them to go and do good in the world. And they're simple words. Vita, dulce do, that's one word, et spes. Or life, sweetness, and hope. And the words come from a prayer, the Salve Regina. In English, the Hail Holy Queen. And that prayer acknowledges so much about our human condition, that we know what it is like to live in a world where we can feel like exiles on account of sin, where even we at times walk through a valley of tears. But our desire, our fervent prayer, is that she who learned and pondered, who stood fast in suffering and in joy, might guide us in the contemplation of eternal life and all that matters. She might help us to discover truth, and especially the truth of her son and the life it promises. And so the three little words, life, sweetness, and hope, are not an attainment of our students on graduation day. They're a commission. For Mary models the need to go and do these things, and her openness to Christ the truth in her life showed them to be possible. I opened with Walker Percy. He said this place is known by just the two lovely words, Our Lady. But the prayer that is sealed on the diploma of all who leave here indicates that those two words signify learning a world that can be made new in Christ. And so I hope, as my students join me at the end of every class lecture, you might join me to end this lecture by saying together, Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor men and children of need. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping to sound of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thy eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy home, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Thank you for your attention. God bless you, and go Irish. Thank you.